Welcome back. Um, so in this lecture we want to do um, Introduction to Animals 2 and we'll start with uh, the mollusks. So there are about 85,000 described species of mollusks, so there's huge diversity in this particular group. Mostly they're uh, marine or salt water and uh, aquatic. There are freshwater mollusks and there's even land mollusks as well. They are eucelomates, so they have that true body coelom. And their major uh, features that are shared by most of them include uh, having a mantle. A mantle is, uh, is a dorsal or outside epidermis or skin-like structure. And in many of these species, it actually secretes the shell. They have a muscular foot. You've probably enjoyed eating them before if you've ever had calamari or octopus tentacles or clam strips or scallops. All of those um, structures are the muscular foot. The uh, visceral, visceral mass is the location of a collection of an internal organs. So they have lots of different kinds of internal organs, and uh, the visceral mass is what those are called. And uh, more complex excretory systems, they actually have metanephridia, so a little bit more complex than what we saw in um, earlier organisms. They do have a mouth and a separate anus, so they have a complete digestive system or digestive tract. And they have what we call an open circulatory system. This is the first organism we've seen with a circulatory system. In an open circulatory system, you have a heart and a pumping vessel, and then the juices are circulated inside of the internal cavities of the organism's body. But the blood and, uh, and blood-like material is not circulated in blood vessels like you'd have in a closed circulatory system like, um, like in your body. So the metanephridia are, are more complex uh, excretory structures, and uh, they're going to be responsible for removing waste products out of the body of the organism. So you can see down here they have a tube that opens up into the body cavity. Waste products or juices from the body will go into these tubes, and waste products will be filtered so that eventually they go through all these tubes and eventually they're excreted outside of the body through the nephridia pore. So this is a little bit more complex than what we saw in the platyhelminthes and uh, it'll get more and more complex and eventually it'll be to the point of um, where you have an actual kidney. My cat's over here drinking out of my cup, thankfully. All right, go on. So um, phylum mollusca has seven classes that are recognized today. Probably this will change maybe as uh, the data keep on coming in and get better. But um, some of these you'll never see, so uh, I'll just basically show you a picture of them. Others of them you will uh, see commonly, and I'll talk a little bit more uh, about. So we'll, uh, this little cladogram here shows you bivalvia, the scallops, clams, and mollusks. We have the monoplacophora, which will be the limpets, and uh, we'll just look at a picture of those. The gastropods, you're very familiar with snail slugs um, and, uh, and uh, sea hares. And uh, cephalopods will include squids, octopuses, uh, nautiluses, and ammonites. Scaphopoda would be your tusk shells. A placophora, I've never even seen one of these myself, but they're warm like little uh, mollusks. And polyplacophora would be what you call the chitons. All right, so I want to go through and show you uh, just a sampling of these. So this is a scallop here, and this would be an example of bivalvia. It's kind of cool. You can see little sensitive eye spots that go all the way around. They have little fleshy tentacles they use for sensory structures. And then there's the muscular foot that we actually eat. If you look inside a clam and do a clam dissection, it's kind of sometimes hard to see some of the parts. And uh, so um, you, you have uh, the, let's see if I can orient myself here. So they do have gills, what they use to extract uh, oxygen out of uh, water and get rid of carbon dioxide. They do have the ability to, um, to have, uh, you know, a, a current that goes through their bodies. So we have an in-current siphon and then an excurrent siphon. So water comes in and then the gills will trap food particles, oxygen, and release gases, and then it goes out another way. They can use this for jet propulsion and to move themselves around. Here's that muscular foot that we were talking about earlier. 
and uh, that's what you actually eat when you eat clam strips. They do have a mouth, and then they have, you know, a, kind of like uh, some intestines and a gut, and then it actually goes out through the anus. So waste products go out this way, food comes in this way. Um, and then they have, uh, you know, they do have a coelom, they do have a heart and a pumping vessel, but uh, they have an open circulatory system. Here's the mantle that secretes the shell all the way around the outside edge is the mantle that secretes the shell. And uh, so they do have very strong muscles that can close the shells um, to, to uh, protect them from things like predators. Shellfish you have to be careful of. So in some areas where you have heavy um, red tides or dinoflagellates that are blooming, um, they actually might create enough nerve toxin that will get into these, uh, these shellfish. And uh, if you eat the shellfish with these toxins, it can cause paralytic shellfish poisoning. So um, you can get paralysis. There's also sh uh, shellfish amnesia. So there's different nerve toxins you can get um, exposed to. And, uh, and because of eating these things. Remember, these are filter feeders, and they will filter out the little bacteria or, or protistal organisms that are creating those toxins and uh, accumulate those toxins in their body. So in some areas, clams, oysters, mussels, or scallops cannot be harvested um, because you don't want to poison people. So this is a limpet, and uh, this would be the bottom of the limpet. This is the top of the limpet. So it uh, has a, the ability to adhere to rocks, and then the shell forms a protective layer around it. This is an example of a gastropod. So this would be just a common um, snail. And you can see it has little eye stalks, little sensory tentacles. Okay, the brain or ganglia would be right here, and the mouth, of course, would be right here. And this is the muscular foot that it slides across. Typically, it produces mucus that uh, it slides across. And the shell is kind of interesting. So the shell is coiled or spiral in shape. And uh, as the animal grows, it does grow little layers of, uh, of new shell material as it, uh, as it gets larger in size. This is just a basic body plan of a, of, a, of a gastropod. So you have the mouth here and you have the anus on the backside surface. I'm just going to get my pen ready here. So you have a mouth and then you have the anus on the backside surface. And uh, at the mouth there's a little part called a radula. The radula you can see is blown up over here, but this is a little rasp-like part that it can actually take and, um, and drill or, or um, drill through shells and actually eat uh, things like clams. Um, there are modified radulas. Sometimes they have little harpoons. I'll show you a cone snail in a second that has a harpoon, so they can be modified. You can see the shell. The shell is made by the, uh, the mantle, which is the purple structure that you see right here. And... Uh, and so through the mouth all the way to the anus, there's a series of stomach, intestines, and digestive glands that uh, aid in digestion. They do have the nephridium to have uh, excretion. They do have a coelom. They do have male and female parts, gonads, that they uh, can use for reproduction. And uh, sometimes they have ganglia and the little nerve cords that will extend out. There's that muscular foot that it uses for, for um for movement or locomotion. And they do have gills to extract oxygen out of the water and a heart and then a pumping vessel. And uh, it has an open circulatory system. There's that cone snail I was talking to you about earlier. Um, these are very beautiful shells. A lot of times people will collect these for, um, you know, for a shell collection. But you have to be very careful of these things because of this end of the animal. You can see it has a little harpoon that it has um, it, it has a barb on it and it uses that for hunting. If you go back further in, you will, so if we go back further in, we have a little harpoon sack and there is a, uh, a venom gland and a venom duct. So this little harpoon, when it shoots into its prey, can inject a little dose of, uh, of uh, venom. These venoms typically are, are going to be um, venoms that will paralyze the prey and uh, so that it can be digested quickly or captured quickly and then eaten. And I have a little video you can watch online um, about uh, the hunting of uh, the cone snails hunting. 
So let's talk about cephalopods for a second. Cephalopods are probably something you're very familiar with. This is an octopus. You can see an octopus has tentacles and has little suction cups on the tentacles it can use for, for capturing prey and for also um, um, movement uh, and attaching to substances. The mouth will be lo located on the underside. They do have a beak, almost like a bird kind of, and uh, they do have siphons. Um, they have large brains and uh, good sense organs. This is just a picture showing you some of the internal structure of a of a of an octopus, and uh, they do have the the mouth and the anus, so they have a complete digestive tract. They have an open circulatory system. You know they have the regular parts, the metanephridia. They have an ink sac that they use for you know squirting ink out to uh, as camouflage. Um, their muscular foot is divided into tentacles, so um, they do have a mantle. And uh, the mantle doesn't secrete a shell, but it just secretes a skin. Sometimes they have shell remnants, or in squid you'll have a pen. Um, they do have a muscle, excuse me, a stomach, and, uh, you know, intestines and uh, digestive organs. Um, they have poison glands a lot of times. Some of the poison glands can be quite poisonous, and that poison is to subdue their prey um, quickly. Um, they have some of the largest... Uh, the largest brains of uh, of any of the uh, invertebrates in the water, and they're t they're termed primates of the sea because of their great intelligence and ability to learn. They do have uh, a siphon uh, that brings water in, so an in-current siphon, an ex-current siphon, and they can use jet propulsion when you know water comes out real quickly through the siphon. They can propel themselves, and again, there's that beak I was talking to you about earlier. These are just some examples of, uh, of various uh, cephalopods. We have over here, we have the squid. Here's a little squid that's a little bit more enlarged. Here's a nautilus, and then we have an octopus. And yes, if you go to Virginia or North Carolina, we have octopuses and squid and all different kinds of things that are local here. This is called the blue ringed octopus. This is a relatively small octopus. It's found in uh, waters uh, off the coast of Australia. And uh, I think it's a cool creature. It's a highly venomous creature. It, cre it creates a toxin called tetrodotoxin um, that it uses to subdue its prey. But sometimes uh, people uh, will pick these up and get envenomated. And it, call excuse me, it causes a flaccid paralysis. So your muscles stop working when you're injected with tetrodotoxin. It's very dangerous and very deadly. And this uh, is a little video that you can see uh, that I'll put on Blackboard for you to look at. Or you can look at it through the PowerPoint, whatever you want to do. I can't say I've seen a lot of these. I've only seen these in, uh, in um, uh, shell shops at the beach. But this is a tusk shell. And if you look at the animal, the animal, so here's the sand. It lives under sand. Here's the little uh, top of it. And here's the little muscular foot. And there's little sensory tentacles that come out. But um, these aren't very big, as you can see from this guy holding it. And uh, but but they're they're a different type of um, of mollusks. Um, a plecophora is uh, is this particular organism here. It almost looks worm-like. Uh, I've never personally seen them before, but it's just a different kind of uh, mollusk. And this is a chitin. Again, these are uh, rare in this area. I've never seen one before. And uh, so it's just what it looks like. It has a shell on the outside surface. You can see a little bit of the, a little bit of the muscular foot out here. Uh, mollusks are interesting and cool. And uh, make sure you take a look at the videos that I'll put on there of the cone snail and of the, um, of the blue ringed octopus. All right, our next phylum we want to cover is Annelida, and uh, this means kind of like with rings or ringed. And there's uh, about 16,500 species of these. And their common characteristics include bilateral symmetry. They have a head and a body and a tail. They have uh, metamerism, which means they have segmented bodies. You also have segmented body, a segmented body as well. They have a complete digestive tract with a mouth and a separate anus. They have a closed circulatory system, so they actually are going to have... Um, Hearts are pumping vessels, and they'll have all their blood-like material will be found inside of blood vessels. They have a true coelom, so they're eucoelomates. 
Their gas exchange is occur occurs through skin. Some of them have gills, though. So if you ever see a, a rainstorm and you notice that all the worms are coming up onto your driveway or onto the road, it's because they're drowning under the ground. They actually breathe through their skin, so they have to come to the surface. Now, birds, of course, take advantage of that and eat lots and lots of worms. They do have the metaneferidia, which is the primitive kidney used to excrete uh, waste products out of its body. And they may be monoecious or dioecious, so they may have male and female parts in one animal, or they may have separate males and females, be dioecious, separate males and females. So these are just some of the classes. Remember, we're talking about the kingdom Animalia, the phylum Annelida, and these are the classes. So we have the oligochetes, the polychetes, and then we have the leeches. And uh, so oligochetes are going to be things um, that are going to be like your, uh, your um, earthworms that you see. Polychetes are mostly marine, um, marine uh, annelids. And uh, you might not have seen too many of those before. And then leeches uh, are common. You see those in this area. And these are parasites of, uh, of other creatures. This is just showing you uh, an example of, uh, of, a, of an annelid and some of the parts that it has. Notice that you have a mouth and an anus. And in between, you have a series of, of digestive organs. The digestive tract gets pretty complex in these animals. You have a pharynx, which is muscular. It's almost like a muscular pump sucking food in. You have uh, an esophagus. It's a tube that leads down to the crop. So the crop is a little storage organ, and the gizzard has little rocks and things in it to help grind food up. And then the rest of the animal is nothing but a long intestine. Okay, it takes a lot. It takes a, it takes a, a great deal of a, a intestine um, to absorb food from what they eat. What this particular worm eats is probably like decaying vegetation. So anything that's decaying in the soil, dirt is what it will eat, and it has to extract nutrients from that. Um, another major characteristic are having pumping vessels. Some people describe them as having more than one heart, but these are little pumping vessels. And notice that the blood is pumped through uh, blood vessels, so it's a complete uh, circulatory system. Uh, excuse me, a closed circulatory system. They do have uh, ganglia, little collections of brain cells or nerve cells, and then they have a cord that goes out so that it can feel or sense things throughout its whole body. And it does have the metaneferidia, so in each of the little segments of its body, you can see it's, oh, it's a segmented body, they're going to have these little metaneferidia, which will excrete waste products out of its body. So that's a little bit about the earthworm anatomy. So let me go through the classes. This is oligochaeta. An example would be the earthworm. And you can see that the earthworms at the top panel up here, this little thing, they're actually mating. So each of them have male parts and female parts. You can see they have seminal vesicles. Let me change my pen color here. They have seminal vesicles that produce the, um, the sperm cells. And, uh, and then they have um, uh, seminal receptacles where they can receive sperm cells from other organisms. So um, they also have eggs. So here we have the ovary down here that has the eggs. This little structure right here that you see, this little structure right here, it's called the clitellum, and the clitellum is, uh, it aids them, and when they release their eggs, the clitellum will release from its body, and it will move forward and come off of its body, and the clitellum will surround the eggs and encase the eggs. So sometimes you can find a, an earthworm without a clitellum, and uh, that because, that's because it just laid its egg, eggs. This is one of the world's largest earthworms. It's found in Australia. You can see they get to be pretty big. And we'll move on to talking about the polychaetes. The polychaetes are marine, uh, typically marine. And uh, you can see some of the examples here. So they come in beautiful colors. Sometimes they have little leg-like structures that come off the sides of them. Um, they help them in locomotion or extracting gases from the from the surrounding. Here, sometimes they have gills. These, this is one that has feather-like gills, and uh, they're beautiful uh, creatures. And for the leeches, I went ahead and showed you the world's largest leech here. This is a leech found in uh, French Guiana, which is a country in south of the, the northern part of South America. 
And uh, this down here is the medicinal leech. And this is just a cool leech on a leaf, a land leech. So leeches can be aquatic or they can be terrestrial. And uh, they're blood drinkers. So um, that's how they make their living. Um, this leech down here is like an accordion. It can stretch way out. So it gets a lot longer than what you see right there. But then it can contract back into a smaller stage. And uh, they do have little suction cups where they can hold on to uh, adhere to uh, substrate or to a, to a, a, a prey animal. And uh, they are venomous. They, they spit a venom, venom inside of a prey that's anticoagulant, so blood cells can't clot. So the blood keeps on flowing, and uh, it also uh, is an anesthetic as well, um, reducing down the, the sensation you would feel when it bites into you. Cool creatures. Uh, when I do turtle trapping, I find leeches all the time on turtles. They're very common in our area. All right, so we'll go ahead and we'll talk about Iketozoa. We just finished talking about Locotrophozoa. Again, molecular data is how we separate these creatures out. Iketozoa means shedding animal. And we're going to talk about the phylum Nematoda and Arthropoda will be the two major groups of Iketozoa that we'll talk about. These are two really important groups medically and ecologically. So we'll uh, spend a little bit of time talking about them. So the nematode can be marine, freshwater, or terrestrial. It can be free-living or parasitic. It does have a pseudocelum, so it doesn't have that true coelom. It does have a cuticle, which is an outer covering that covers the outside surface to prevent drying. It does have a complete digestive tract with a mouth and a separate anus. It is dioecious, separate males and females. No respiratory or circulatory system, so that it does limit their size to a degree. Um, excretory system is not well developed in these particular creatures. This happens to be an example of a nematode uh, that's free living. But I want to talk about the parasitic ones because they're really super important. You can see the mouth and the anus would be down here. That's the cuticle that you see on the outside surface. And uh, these worms aren't necessarily that big, um, but they're very, very, very common um, in this area. So I want to talk about a couple of the medically important uh, parasitic worms. The one, this one happens to be the trachina worm. And here is what it looks like when it's inside of muscle tissue. Typically we eat raw pork and then we acquire the worm inside our body. They do have a complex life cycle with many different steps. We can just uh, start with, um, with uh, a human poops out eggs. The, uh, and... Uh, so we'll go ahead and we'll say that the human poops out eggs and the eggs get inside of uh, a, a, a pig. Inside of the pig, it lives inside the muscle tissue and then the human actually eats it. So the worm will come down and it'll live inside the intestine. And, uh, and then it, uh, of course, the, the eggs will be pooped out so that uh, they get back into pigs. So if you eat, don't eat raw pork or raw meat, you typically will not get a trachina worm. So that's one that you can prevent yourself from getting. Pinworms, most people have pinworms at some time in their lifetime. Here's the eggs over here and here's the little worm. These are commonly spread um, through children. Um, they are fecal oral, so the eggs get on kids' fingers. Kids then, you know, uh, touch other kids or touch toys, and then they spread because kids don't wash their hands before they eat. Uh, I would encourage you to wash your hands before you eat. One of the things you can prevent yourself from getting will be the penworm. Um, as a parent, one of the tests you do for penworms is the tape test. So a penworm, we eat the eggs. It lives in our intestines and eats our food. The females will have an interesting behavior. They will come down to the end of the anus, and at night, around the edge of the anus, the female will lay eggs around the edge of the anus, and when she does that, she irritates the anus, and typically people will scratch something that's irritated, and you get the, you know, underneath your fingernails, you get the, the little worm eggs, and, you know, kids wake up in the morning because they don't have real sanitary habits, and they'll, you know, get in your face and 
wipe their hands across your face and give you the worm. So a lot of times once one person in your family has it, everybody in your family has it. And uh, the tape test is where you take a piece of, of clear tape and you, in the, at the nighttime when the female lays these eggs, you go into the room and take your child and put a piece of tape across the anus. And if you pick the tape up, you can sometimes see the worms or see the eggs. You can take them into a professional and they'll actually analyze them. So it's glamorous being a parent and doing a tape test. Okay. Um, there is a medication you can take orally and eliminate these worms from your body. So they're just annoying, but not really deadly. Ascarid worms, uh, here's the egg and here's the worm. These get pretty big. I mean, so they'll be a pretty large worm. Um, but th we get these by eating, uh, uh, just eating infected uh, uh, eggs or infected vegetables. So if you have feces that gets over plants and people eat the plants, the worm comes into your body and lives in your intestines. It's kind of an interesting worm, though. So as an embryo it will, uh, or a larvae, it'll actually hatch out, go drill through your intestines, enter into your lungs, crawl up your lungs, and then you actually comes out of your lungs and goes back into your digestive tract and lives there as an adult. So kind of a complex uh, roundabout way of living. Um, the female lays thousands and thousands of eggs every day. And, uh, and so um, they're, they're kind of interesting. The female can actually move, well, the male and female can actually move around. Sometimes they move into your intestines. Sometimes they move up your esophagus. Sometimes they come out of the nose. Sometimes people vomit them out. Um, so it's a very common worm. So if you ever have a child that vomits or an animal that vomits, look through the vomitus and see if it's worms. Sometimes you can have a worm infection. Um, how do you know you have these things? Uh, abdominal pain, discomfort, and uh, seeing the eggs and the feces or even living worms in the feces. Again, you can take a pill and, uh, and uh, get the, rid of these particular worms. The hookworm is uh, bordering into more dangerous territory. The hookworm, here's what it looks like as an egg and as, uh, as an adult. Um, they don't get too big, you know, some, something we're in the 5 to 10 millimeter range. And uh, this is one that's under a scanning electron microscope picture where you can see the actual jaws. I think this is kind of a cool worm here because of the jaws. The way you acquired this one is that it drills through your skin. So if you don't wear shoes or you don't wear gloves and you're digging into the soil, the little uh, larvae will drill through your skin. They get into your circulatory system and eventually they will move into your lungs. And then they'll crawl out of your lungs and get into your digestive tract and you swallow them. And then they live in your intestines. They drill into your intestines until they find a blood vessel and then they drink blood. Now, if you only had one worm, there's no problem. But if you have lots of these worms, they drink so much blood that, um, that they actually do damage to you. They can cause anemia, and, uh, which is where you have a lack of blood cells. There are millions and millions and millions of gallons of blood that are consumed by these creatures every, um, every year. Again, you can detect these by doing a, a fecal test where you look for their eggs and you can kill them with medication. Here's a filarial worm and here's the worm over here that you can see inside of a person's uh, blood smear. And the filaria worm is carried by mosquitoes and the mosquito injects the worm into you, the larvae into you. And what these worms do is there's a series of tubes that drain water in your body called lymphatic tubes or lymph vessels. And what these worms do is they get into your vessels and they block the vessels so you can't drain water out of your body. Now let me tell you what you're looking at over here. What you're looking at is a person's leg here, normal leg, and this is the leg that's been swollen because the lymphatic vessels can't drain fluid out of the body. Okay, so this is a pretty nasty worm, one that you don't want to get in contact with. They are very common in equatorial regions and uh, cause these kinds of problems for people. Around here we can have surgery to remove them and uh, we have medications to remove them, but in countries where people are poor they can't afford the medications. This is called the guinea worm. The guinea worm is one that um, basically crawls through your skin and gets underneath the skin and lives. You can see in this person right here they have an active worm inside this wound. Um, 
In areas where you don't have surgery or medications to remove them, you use a matchstick. So here's the wound. The worm is being wound around a matchstick. You can see it's being wound around a matchstick here. And uh, it takes a period of days to wind the worm around the matchstick and extract it out of the body of the person that's infected. Um, these are uh, found in equatorial regions, and you definitely want to wear your shoes in equatorial regions. Okay, our last group is going to be the phylum Arthropoda. This is our last Aketozoan. And uh, they have the characteristics of having jointed legs or jointed appendages. They have a segmented body. They have a small coelom, and uh, we term it a hemocele. And these are blood-filled filled spaces. They have an exoskeleton made of chitin, and this is a hard shell that their body is made of. They grow by shedding their shell or molting and growing a new shell um, when they want to grow larger. They do have a complete digestive tract, a mouth and an anus separated. They have well-developed sense organs, an open circulatory system, so they have a pump, pumping vessels or pumping heart, and uh, but no blood vessels that contain all of the, the uh, hemolymph. Um, yes, they have hemolymph instead of blood. It's a blood-like material. And you've experienced this before if you've ever driven down the road in a blood you know, and a bug smacks your window seal and you see that brown fluid, that's hemolymph. Um, not necessarily blood, but hemolymph. Respiration can occur through body surfaces, through gills, through tracheae, or through book lungs. I'll go through um, the, trache the tracheal system with you when, um, when I do um, the circulatory system and respiratory systems later on. So arthropods include things like millipedes and centipedes and crustaceans, arachnids, insects. And what I want to do is go through each of those groups and show you the basic body plan that they share in common. So millipedes are going to be characteristically have two pairs of legs for each body section. So if you ever look at a millipede, if you look at each section of its body, it's going to have two pairs of legs that come out of it. Now, centipedes will only have one pair of legs, okay? They are typically poisonous. Sometimes they produce different kinds of chemicals. Um, one of my favorite ones is the cyanide-producing millipede that you see over here. They produce cyanide, and uh, I'll talk more about that in a second. They can roll up into a ball for protection to protect their underside or, or softer portions of their body. And they're mainly herbivores, eating vegetation. These are real important in a forest because they eat the fallen leaves. So in fall, when the trees shed their leaves, um, one of the things that eats the leaves up will be the millipedes. And of course, when they poop, they poop soil. This is a little video clip I got over at Rock Castle Gorge, which is a very nice walking trail over in, um, in Patrick County. And I just wanted to show you, this is the little cyanide producing millipede walking around. And you can see two, le two legs per body section, two pairs of legs per each body section. And uh, this confidently walks around during the daytime because it knows it produces uh, cyanide. You can see it has the warning color, kind of a brown or black and yellow. And uh, if you were to eat this, if you were a, uh, a bird and you were to eat this, the chemical makes you very, very sick. Um, so if you ever take one of these and put it in your hand and, uh, and play with it for a second, it starts to smell like almonds or cherries, and that's the hydrogen cyanide that's being produced. Um, so kind of a cool organism, and we have those here locally. So take a look at them and enjoy them. They're really cool looking. So centipedes uh, have one pair of legs for, for each of their body section. And uh, they also are all venomous. And uh, if I take my pen here and, and show you, their first pair of legs are modified into these poison claws. And that's where they inject, uh, excuse me, venom claws. And that's where they inject venom. So if I were to sketch one out real quickly for you, it kind of looks like this. And it's got, you know, a venom gland that's attached to it. And it's got a tip right here that's really sharp. So they inject venom into their prey and subdue their prey in that kind of way. 
there's none that are real super deadly to humans, although there are like the Vietnamese uh, centipede can be really big and it looks like it could eject a lot of venom and, and it just causes you pain. They are predators, that's why they have venom, uh, the venom claws, and they're typically flat. So uh, remember that they have one pair of legs. It's a terrible drawing, sorry about that. They have one pair of legs for each section of their body. And a lot of times they are colorful to show you that they have venom. But nothing around here is going to be super dangerous to you. Now, I, I say that with a cautionary uh, point. Some people do have allergic reactions to, um, to their venom and can have anaphylactic shock, but most people don't. So crustaceans have these characteristics. They have two pairs of antennae, antennae and they're important in, in aquatic food chains. So you can see they're very diverse. This is a mantis shrimp down here and a lobster, and there's a little fiddler crab. Um, so they're very diverse in their shapes and forms, but they do have two pairs of antennae, um, which are the little sensory structures that you see at the, typically at the front of the head. Sometimes they're small, like you can't even hardly see them in the fiddler crab, and uh, sometimes they're large. You can see them in this mantis shrimp here. The crustaceans are awesome organisms. They're very important in aquatic ecosystems, and uh, so really important creatures and tasty if you like if you um, eat meat. Calicerata includes a whole diverse group of creatures. They include things like uh, your spiders or your arachnids. They include things like mites. So these include things that uh, um, that uh, infect humans, like chiggers. Chiggers are larval mites that uh, they come in and try to burrow into human skin and uh, they, your immune system reacts to them causing that swelly, swelling and itchy spot. Um, Chelicerata include ticks and they include scorpions and then uh, things that you call granddaddy long legs but they're also actually called harvestmen. Harvestmen. And uh, those, uh, those are also Chelicerata. Chelicerata refers to a characteristic having chelicera, which are little fang-like structures they use to inject venom or to eat with. So they do have two major body sections and four pairs of legs. So each of them has two body sections and four pairs of legs. And uh, many of them are venomous. So if you look at, at spiders, they're venomous. And scorpions are venomous. And the uh, ticks are venomous. Uh, I don't think harvestmen have any venom that I'm aware of, and mites um, may be slightly venomous. They do, in, uh, they do spit digestive juices into humans or other animals to digest or liquefy tissue, so I guess you consider, could consider them to be venomous. If you are interested in venomous animals, uh, I recommend highly to you this particular book right here. Let's see if I can make myself look bigger. So um, it's kind of hard to do this with the web screen here, but uh, but this is a, a book that I just read called um, called Venomous, The Earth's Deadliest Creatures, How the Earth's Deadliest Creatures Mastered Biochemistry, and uh, it's by Christine uh, Wilcox. This is a great book. It's not too big of a read. It's not too big, um, but um, it's a great book on venomous species. So I encourage you to take a look at that if you get an opportunity to. And our, our last group of, uh, of arthropods that we're going to talk about are the insects. And they have characteristics like having three body sections, which includes a head, a thorax, and an abdomen. So here is the head the thorax and the abdomen and there are certain parts on each of those of those structures they have three pairs of legs attached to the middle section called the thorax they have one pair of antennae attached to the head those are sensory structures and they're the only arthropod with wings i can't say they're the only arthropod that flies because there are spiders when they first hatch out when a little spiderling first hatches out they will produce silk parachutes and catch the wind with little silk parachutes and they can fly around but um, these are the only arthropods with wings 
you know, I would expect you to know a little bit of the anatomy of an insect. There are thousands and thousands of different kinds of insects, most of them being beetles, but uh, there are lots and lots of insects. So you can see the major regions, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. The head will have the, the antennae. It'll have the ganglia or the brain-like structure, the mouth, the pharynx. These will be things that you'll find in the, um, in the uh, head. Um, also, the eyes will be found there. They have oftentimes compound and, and simple eyes on the head. So in the thorax, you have, uh, you have uh, the, uh, the, the wings will be attached and the legs will be attached to the thorax. And then the abdomen will have like reproductive parts. It'll have your major digestive organs. Um, there will be little holes called spiracles that lead to little tubes called uh, trachea. And uh, so these little spiracles are breathing tubes. They allow air in, carbon dioxide out. So the air comes in and these, these, this trachea will branch all throughout the uh, body to take oxygen into the cells and carry carbon dioxide out of the cells. Um, these do have an open circulatory system, so you'll see there will be little heart-like structures, pumping vessels, and then there will be little blood vessels, but the blood is um, circulated through just the juices of the body. And they do have a nerve cord that extends down through the um, ventral or belly side of the animal. Um, arthropods are extremely important. I would uh, expect you to know that they uh, are pollinators. They carry pollen from one flower to the next. They do cause many diseases, uh, especially when you look at the, the, the tsetse fly and uh, carrying um, African sleeping sickness and mosquitoes carrying malaria, yellow fever, um, all different kinds of, uh, of uh, diseases. They can be really important. Diseases are carried by lice and, uh, and other arthropods like fleas. So if you look at black death or plague, that's carried by fleas. So many, many different kinds of diseases. They're also important because they do cause crop damage. And, but you have to realize they are, they're really good too. So because all, a lot of our food, fruits and vegetables come from them. And uh, because of their pollination, they decompose all kinds of dead stuff, recycling nutrients. They are the base of food webs so that we can enjoy eating uh, food. You know, they do serve as the base of food webs. If you eat any kind of fish, arthropods are the base of food webs. They aerate the soil, so they dig tunnels through the soil and aerate the soil, and they disperse spores and seeds, spores from plants and from fungi, and then seeds from uh, more advanced plants. Okay, well that completes the first, uh, well, the second lecture on the introduction to animals. In our next lecture, we're going to cover the deuterostomes, which are the anus first animals, and, uh, and, and we'll talk about uh, echinoderms and chordates, chordates being things like fish all the way to um, mammals. Okay, well, I'll see you next time. Make sure if you have questions, you email them. Make sure you keep up with due dates. Please keep up with study guides and keep up with your work. Uh, don't feel alone. You can email me anytime and uh, talk to other students on, um, on the uh, Blackboard. So let me know if you need anything, and I'll see you next time.